Revelation. We did the church of Ephesus last time, so we're going to go through the um, church at Smyrna through Laodicea. But first, let me ask you a question. The word church, in the Greek language, it's ekklesia. Do you know what that is? What it means? Okay, a body of believers. It actually means called out body or gathering. So it's believers or people. We want to keep emphasizing that. People who are called out. What purpose does the church have? What purpose does the church serve? To share the gospel? I mean, first we receive the gospel and, and, and we um, act on it. But then we're to preach and to share. What else are we to do besides preaching the gospel? Okay, there's um, an idea of working side by side, and maybe fellowship would come in there, that uh, together we get together to encourage and strengthen, and we're with one another. What else does the church do? What do, you, do you have any groups during the week? Discipleship, the D-bands. Um, not only learning, but practically putting in place the truths of Scripture. There's a biblical morality. We're going to see that today in these passages. Now, what else do we do here? We were, we were just singing. What does that, what does that bring to mind? Or so, so an idea of worship or praising God. So we do all these things centered on Jesus Christ. So we see in these six churches that two are very good and four are very bad. And they get progressively worse as we go. Two violate, all but two violate the purposes we've seen for the church. And some of, the, uh, some of the four do some things right, but they, um, they have some things that need to change. The other two are, are blessed by God for their faithfulness in following Him. So last week we looked at Ephesus. Do you remember there's a key phrase that comes to mind, should come to mind with the book of Ephesus. What was the problem with that church? Lost or left their first love. So they violate the great commandment, right? That, what was, what's the great commandment? To love God and love people in simple terms. And they were not loving God as they had at first. They had forgotten that love. I could have put up the slide for the churches. There's six, and I forgot my uh, laser pointer. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see if I can make this thing work. Yep. So we're going to start. Ephesus is um, the church where all these other six churches came out of. We believe that they were probably planted from that church. That church came from Paul and his missionary journeys. So I'm going to have different people read each section. And Skip is going to take the first church. So if you turn in your Bibles to chapter 2 of Revelations, verse 8. Skip, if you would read that for us. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not. But you, excuse me, but they are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. So Smyrna, the persecuted church. John wrote these le this letter towards the end of the first century. Life at that time was difficult and dangerous. 
Smyrna was an avid ally of Rome, and the Romans believed in emperor worship. They had a temple exclusively dedicated to worshiping Roman rulers. It became a death sentence if you chose not to participate in the yearly sacrifice to the emperor. To be a Christian in the Roman Empire during this time was to live in jeopardy every day. The tortures inflicted on these men of faith were despicable. Some Christians were strapped to the rack where they were pulled limb from limb. Others were thrown into boiling oil. Some were devoured by hungry lions in the Colosseum. There's a famous martyr in Smyrna named Polycarp, and he, there's a testimony of him at 156 A.D., just about 50 years after John. And it's a great story, and I'd love to tell it to you, but I just don't have the time. If you have Fox's Book of Martyrs, page 20, you can look it up there. But it's very encouraging. And these are the last words of Polycarp as he's being burned at the stake. I thank you that you are gracious, that you have graciously thought me worthy of this hour. The word Smyrna means myrrh. It's a perfume, and you have to crush it to get the sweet odor out of it. So that gives you an idea of this church. This church is crushed to put forth a sweet smell, a fragrant odor back to God. The church was poor. Many of the believers were probably slaves and were destitute. But in spite of this, verse 9, you'll read this. You are rich. Rich not in physical wealth, but spiritually. The worship in Smyrna did not only include emperors, but only, but a few, a number of pagan gods. So they had a Roman temple, but they had some others to Zeus, Apollo, Aphrodite, Asclepios, and Sybil, especially Sybil. And the Christians, they worship this invisible God. And so they were accused of being atheists because uh, no one could see their, their idol God. So they finally faced blasphemy and they, they were turned in by the Jews. The Jews that say they are Jews but are really not, it says here in verse 9. That would be like the Pharisees of Jesus' day. And those Jews hated and rejected Christ just as much as if they had worshipped pagan gods or Satan himself. So they, they hated them for what they believed. Hoping to destroy the Christian faith, some of the Smyrna wealthy, influential Jews reported them Turned them in. And so these hater Jews were, to, were said to be of the synagogue of Satan, verse 9. With all this opposition, how does Jesus encourage and comfort the Smyrna believers? Well, you'll read it here. If you look in the introduction at verse 8, letter written by Jesus Christ, who is the first and last. He's the eternal one, the one who was dead but now is alive. See, he suffered the worst persecution of all at the cross. And he conquered the grave. And he's sovereign over their times and their circumstances. Who could relate better to this situation of persecution than Jesus? Therefore, verse 10, there is weight when he says their persecution will be limited in time to 10 days, which may be actual or it may be a, um, a term that's used for a short period. When he says, I know your works, they can be sure he knows them thoroughly and completely. And he also promises to those who are faithful, even in death, a crown of life. And at the end of this passage, he says, the second death, it won't be able to touch you. The second death, of course, being not physical death, but spiritual death, damnation in hell. It's not going to touch you. That's an encouragement when you're going through the terrible persecution the Smyrna church did. 
So now um, let's read chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. And that is Parker. Write this letter to the church, to the angel of the church in Pergamum. This is the message from the one with the sharp two-edged sword. I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne, yet you have remained loyal to me. You refuse to deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. But I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. In a similar way, you have some Nicolaitans among you who follow the same teaching. Repent of your sin, or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven. And I will give to each one a white stone, and on that stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. Okay. Pergamum, which is Pergamos right here, north of Smyrna. The worldly church. You live in the city where Satan has his throne, it says, verse 13. Pergamum was 150 miles north of Ephesus. It was considered uh, Asia's greatest city and by far the most dis distinguished city in Asia. By the time John had penned this, Pergamum had uh, been the capital of Asia for 250 years. So this is like the Washington, D.C. of the day. They had a huge library, 200,000 200, scrolls in their library, which was second only to Alexandria. Pergamum was an important center of worship and it had four main deities um, in the Greco-Roman temples that they had. Athena, Ascalopius, Dionysus, and Zeus were there. But overshadowing all this was Pergamum's devotion to emperor worship just like in Smyrna. Pergamum built the first temple devoted to emperor worship in Asia, and in spite of the daily risk of persecution and death, the believers were true to Christ, and they didn't deny their faith. Even when Anipus, he was taken from the church and martyred. We don't know anything about this man and the details of his life. Tradition says that he was roasted in a bronze kettle. The persecution was probably carried out by the Romans, and Pergamum was known as the city where Satan had his throne because the altar of Zeus was there. And if you look at the seven ancient wonders of the world, this was one of them. In spite of their faithfulness, he had a few complaints against them. Verse 14. Like many churches today, the church at Pergamum failed to obey the biblical mandate to practice church discipline. In other words, they had people in the church that were sinning and they wouldn't confront that. If you read Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 18, it talks about church discipline. It talks about going to a person who's caught in a sin and uh, with one person and then two people if they won't listen and then brought before the church. Specifically, Christ was concerned with two heresies being tolerated at Pergamum. One associated with the Old Testament character Balaam. You see him in Numbers chapter 22 through 25. And he was uh, fearful of the Israelites. Uh, actually, he wasn't, but Balak was fearful of the Israelites for what they had done to the Amorites. So Balak was the king of Moab and he hired Balaam to curse them. After trying, he comes to him to curse him, and the words will not come out of his mouth. Instead, he gives them a blessing three times. Oops. After, um, after that, they decided to take a different route. Balaam came up with another plan, and since he was unable to curse them, he decided he would corrupt them from within. So he taught Balak how to seduce the Israelites. The Moabite women seduced them, and they 
married them and they took a part of their pagan religion and so they were corrupted. That's Balaam's teaching. In the church it had crept in because people had eaten sacrifices to idols. Verse 14. It wasn't as simple as just eating the food, but by partaking in this food, they actually become sharers in demons. If you read 1 Corinthians 10, verse 20, it it speaks about that. Furthermore, involvement in these pagan festivals made it easier to indulge in sexual intercourse, which was part of the worship with the prostitutes, which were at the temple. And they prostituted themselves for the gods that they served, and that was part of of the worship. The Nicolaitan heresy speaks about here is very similar to Balaam's. I'm not going to go into that further. So here's Jesus' response to this. Verse 16. Pretty predictable. What does he say? Repent. Turn from your sin or judgment will be sudden. I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. The sword is the Word of God. And it's uh, seen uh, in several places. In Revelation 19, which we'll see later, he destroys the nations with the sword of his mouth. Notice how Jesus introduced himself. Verse 12, the one with the sharp, two-edged sword. For the believer, it's painful, but it's a comfort to know He says in Hebrews 4.12 that the sword cuts straight into your soul, dividing soul and spirit, exposing your innermost thoughts and desires. And we need our innermost desires and thoughts exposed, don't we? So we can see them and address them and come back to Him. For the unbeliever, the sword is used in judgment. He gives three promises to those who repent. By His strength, they're victorious. And there's three things He gives them. Hidden manna, which is spiritual nourishment, and that would be like this word, a Bible with you know, turned edges from being used so much. A white stone. And there's several interpretations of this, but... The most common one was that there, were, there was a white stone that was given in a trial if a person was innocent or acquitted, and a black stone given if they were condemned. So the white stone seems to mean that your um, forgiveness, total forgiveness, and complete. The stone will be engraved with a name no one understands except the one who receives it, and it's a brand, it's brand new. I believe it means admission. It's an admission pass into eternal glory. The church's failure is its tolerance. Notice the word. Jesus Christ would have us to be intolerant of sexual immorality and idolatry. Wait a minute. We live in a PC world, don't we? Is that politically correct? Well... I would suggest to you that as we deal with people in society, we need to love them. And it doesn't matter who they are exactly. We can't partake of their sin, but we need to love them, befriend them, and reach out to them. But within the church, we have to be intolerant of immorality in people who are believers in Christ. And that's why we use church discipline, to keep the church pure, but also There's the idea of restoration, that the person would see their sin, that they would be convicted, that they would be restored and changed. So it's compassionate, not mean. Skip, I'd like you to read the next section. Our third church, which is here, Thyatira. Oh, wait, where's my pointer? There it is, right here. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. 
Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, to the rest of Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thanks, Skip. The church of Thyatira, the church that tolerated sin. We thought the last church tolerated sin. Well, it's worse here. Most of the church is involved, not just a few people. And there's a progression among these seven churches. It gets worse as far as the sinfulness of the evil uh, within these churches. This is the largest letter that's given to the smallest town. And I think that should relate. We should relate to that, right? Because we're a little bitty. We're a little town, aren't we? And God thinks it important that he speak in a letter to this little tiny church. Nothing special, but God intentionally writes to them. Lydia was from here. She's a seller of purple, and that was a claim to fame for Thyatira. They sold this purple cloth. But notice how God writes. As we look at these letters, it's interesting. He writes them in a particular way. He starts with commendations. He gives them positive things about their character and what they're doing. And then he brings in his complaint. And I would suggest to you, as we deal with people, that's a good way to do it. I, went, I had a problem in my office one time. I had to write a letter to a lady who was really being rebellious, and I really wanted to let her have it. But our pastor came, and he suggested that we write a letter emphasizing her positive points, which I didn't see at that point. But, <laughs> and you may be there, right? You have some people that you deal with that uh, may need to change, and you may have a hard time seeing what could be positive about them? What could be right about them? But we need to do that. That's the way God does it. Verse 19. He praises them for their love, faith, service, and progress in all these things. And in Thyatira, the primary God worshipped was Apollo, the Greek sun god. There were a number of guilds or unions, kind of like the carpenter's union or the plumbers union that were present and each of these guilds had its own deity its own god and so they had honor feasts that were held complete with meat sacrifice to idols and sexual immorality that was involved in all of it just like in the last church but he says i have a complaint against you what is it verse 20 they have a jezebel now is this the jezebel we know from the old testament now she died a thousand years ago. It's a Jezebel who's like her. The Old Testament Jezebel did this. She persuaded her husband to build a temple to a goddess whose religion made sexual immorality a part of worship, just like we're seeing here. And Jezebel and her immoral cult killed all the prophets of the day, or most of them. There were some that were kept by God. She would come to a sudden end being tossed out of a window and her body being eaten by dogs. Jezebel embodied immorality and idolatry. Thyatira's sin was a willingness to allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and actually seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality in the church and eat things sacrificed to idols. 
This wasn't only encouragement to sin, like, yeah, you go out and do that, but this was, no, I'll teach you how to do this myself. This wicked act, this woman with many of the men in the church committed sexual intercourse, fornication with them as part of worship. And you'll see in verse 20, this is probably a play on words. Her teachings were the deep things of Satan, he says. Although she probably represented them as the deep things of God. You need to get to know God through this experience that we're going to take part of. Wasn't a new problem. Apparently, she had been there a while because it says that, the, that she had been tolerated. Jesus doesn't judge her right away. He gives her time to repent. So she was there for a while. Verse 21. So Christ is patient, even with the wickedness of this sin, even with this woman. But to, to no avail, she doesn't repent. So Jesus said, I will give her a bed of sickness in some of your translations. The NLT says suffering. Um, actually, in the original language, some equate this with judgment in hell. And those who committed adultery with her will suffer greatly unless they repent, unless they turn away from her evil deeds. It's one thing to commit sexual sin. Any of us are capable of that. But it's another thing altogether to take people and to teach them that it's right. It's a terrible thing to be a teacher, a mentor in that. Jesus said it would be better for that person to have a millstone around their neck and be cast in the depths of the sea than to teach others and lead them astray. She was an influential person in the church. So to her children... Spiritual offering, or spiritual offspring of her, he says, his words are straight. I will kill them, Jesus says, verse 23. So all the churches will know that every person's thoughts and intents, God knows them completely, and he's not uh, passive about it. There's a message to those who stand true to the end, verse 26. He promises they will reign with Him in authority over the nations, verse 26 and 27. They will receive the best of all, the morning star. Verse 28, Jesus Christ Himself. Isn't that great? That we, the greatest reward that we can have is God given to us. I mean, He indwells us as believers, but to have Him forever. The light of heaven is what? It's... It's God Himself. What a great thing to be with Him. We're going to read about Sardis. That's Matt. And we're going to look at chapter 3, verse 1. And Sardis, let me show you on the map. Can you turn the slide? Sardis is here. We want it to be in yellow. Oh, there it is. Thanks, Nate. <laughs> you ready, Matt? Yep. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you still, if still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So if you came to this church and you peeped into the windows of this church, you'd see people that were like believers in any um, regular on-fire church. They, they were there and they were singing and praising God and reading Scripture and preaching. But there was a problem. We think this church is alive for Christ, but we'd be wrong. 
Because he says she's dead. This is a morgue with a steeple. These people are spiritually dead. They looked healthy on the outside, but you can see it, verse 1. Notice how Jesus addresses this church as the one who has the seven spirits. I believe this symbolizes the Holy Spirit who regenerates, who brings life to believers that were spiritless and lifeless before he brings life into their soul. Verse 1, they had a reputation for being alive, but Jesus knows all things. They apparently were living on their past, their successes, their accomplishments, worship of what they had already done. The thing they were living for, instead of learning from the past and changing, they were worshiping their past and it was destructive to them. You can't live there. It will kill you. If that's all you're looking at. Consumed with finding methods of ministry instead of being concerned for people. Boy, that's big today, isn't it? There's a lot of methods that are out there, but you have to be concerned primarily with people and their souls. Concerned with the looks of the church. We've heard of churches splitting because of the color of the carpet and the pews, the, the covering on the pews. That's all the external stuff. not being concerned with the people's character. Or you could become focused on social problems. There's certainly enough of those, aren't there? I mean, there's abortion and this new gay rights activism that's out, and you could, you could focus on those social problems instead of focusing in your church on heart change of your people. To keep a church living, you've got to go for the heart. They were doing things which look spiritual but lack the power of the Spirit. So Jesus says this. He says, get out your shovel, bury him. Does he say that? Wow, are you guys dead? <laughs> does he say, get out your shovel and bury him? No, he does not. He does not say that. <laughs> Thank you. He says, verse 2, wake up! <laughs> this is the one who can raise the dead. He says, strengthen what remains. Blow on the embers of that fire gone out. Verse 3, go back to what you heard and believed at first. What was it they heard and believed at first? Okay, Jesus in the Gospel. They, they believed in the truth of the Gospel. He says, return to that. The good news of Jesus' death on the cross for my sins to forgive my sins, to give me righteousness through imputing, giving to me His own righteousness. I didn't have any righteousness. But He gives it to me, to you, if you trust in Him. So go back to the Gospel and hold firmly to it. And He says, repent, turn from your sin, turn from looking at the past, and focus on the here and now. Focus on the hope that is coming. You've not been trusting me, but something else. Abandon it. If you'll not repent, I will come to you suddenly as a thief, and I will judge you. See, there's churches that get taken out completely. But there's an amazing uh, find in the ashes. God has a remnant. You know, as you go through the Bible, there's a thing that recurs as a theme that, you know, in the worst of times, in the worst of circumstances, the worst of sin, God has a remnant of people that He keeps, and preserves, and blesses. And that's true here. They've not blackened their clothes with sin. or In fact, they don't get black clothes. They get white robes, right? The righteousness of Christ. Verse 5, their names will be written in the, in the book of life and never erased. That's a great hope, isn't it? Your name's written, it's never going to be taken out. Christ will confess them before His Father and the angels. And did they listen and repent? 
Well, we don't know absolutely, but we know that from this church, there's a guy named Melito who was several decades after John, and he wrote, and he was a believer, and he was writing truth. And so we believe that this church must have responded, at least for a time. God always takes care of His people, even when things are very, very dark. Even in a dead church, He has a small remnant here. And He cares about them. Philadelphia, chapter 3, verse 7, here on the map. Let's see. Oh, where am I? There it is. Right there. It takes time to learn how to do this. Read, Nate, can you read chapter 3, verses 7 through 13? Check. And to the angel in the church in Philadelphia, write the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of, S synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet. And they will learn that I have loved you, because you have kept my word about patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. You try those who dwell in the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thanks, Nate. Philadelphia, the youngest of the seven churches, the city of brotherly love. In 17 AD, earthquakes destroyed Sardis and Philadelphia, but it was rebuilt. For years after this, though, there was a fear among the people um, legitimate fear you know there were aftershocks and when you have buildings fall on people you like don't want to be there and so a lot of people moved to the countryside to get away from that and um, so the church very well may have been small in the city of Philadelphia the church um, was important though it's only one of two churches that uh, has no rebuke was marked by obedience. Verse 8. And they had a little strength. This may refer to the, um, the smallness of the church. It may re uh, also um, suggest how they saw themselves. It's a good place to be, pastors told us, to see yourself of little strength. But you need God's strength. But you obeyed my word and did not deny me. They are given an incredible promise. He puts before them an open door that no one can close. Verse 8, what does that mean? An open door that no one can close. What's he talking about? What did you say? I'm sorry? Sal salvation. And, and maybe more like evangelism to, to reach out with the gospel to people. An open door to God's message of rescue, freedom to share the gospel. And who can give this incredible opportunity? Only, verse 7, the one who is holy and true. Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. The author and the creator of life. And Jesus holds the key of David, the key to the messianic kingdom. He has absolute power to admit anyone he chooses or deny them. What he opens, no one can close, and what he closes, no one can open. Jesus said uh, in John 14, 6, no man comes to the Father except through me. The Philadelphian Christians faced opposition similar to the church in Smyrna. They faced hostility from these unbelieving Jews. 
They rejected Jesus as their Messiah. And they were not a synagogue of God, but it says they were Satan's synagogue, right? Though they claimed they were Jews, they were actually not. They lied. Romans says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, a circumcision of the heart, a heart change, a new heart that's given. That's Romans chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. To the Philadelphian Christians, the Jews would come down uh, at their feet and know that God had loved them. That's a miraculous thing for them to be changed and brought to a place of submission beneath these people who they hated. And they would understand that God loved them legitimately. Verse 9. Bowing down depicts submission. The church enemies would be utterly vanquished and humbled. This must have been a bitter pill for them to swallow. But it may have been at this low point, uh, we don't know, but the, you know the Spirit of God enters in at just those places, doesn't He? And maybe this verse out of Zechariah applies, where he says, Then I'll pour out the Spirit of grace and supplication on the family of David and on the people of Jerusalem. They will look on Me who they have pierced and mourn for Him. They will grieve bitterly for Him. Their hearts break over Jesus the Messiah. They crucify. They may have responded that way or they may simply have humbled themselves but not received the truth. Either way, it's a God thing, right? For, him, for them to bow to their bitterest enemies and realize God's love for them. Because you persevere, I will keep you from the great time of testing that will come on the whole world. This, the great tribulation that we'll speak about. Their church was kept from it as well as all believers. There's some who believe this could apply. Uh, you, you get all kinds of different interpretations and revelations. And uh, some would see this as the Roman Empire. In Luke chapter 2, verse 1, he speaks about the whole world as the Roman Empire. And a crisis there uh, would shake the whole Roman Empire. Uh, that happened in 68 AD when the Jews were taken out. Basically, they lost to the Romans and were conquered. And that shook things up. Jesus promises this, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have. Verse 12, interesting, to a city with no stability. They had these earthquakes, right, that they were afraid of. And he says this, I will make you become pillars. Pillars in the temple of God. Stable, unwavering citizens of the city of my God. The new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven. I will write on them my new name. It will reflect the glorious revelation of His person. That's what this is, isn't it? The revelation of Jesus Christ. Last but not least, the church of Laodicea. The most wicked church of all. But interestingly enough, not because of sexual immorality, it was probably there, but for another reason. Tom is going to read um, Laodicea. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, right. The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For, I, for you say, I am rich and have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched and pitiable, and poor and blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may be clothed, and the shame your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also have conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Laodicea, the lukewarm church. Church at Laodicea represents an apostate church that's existed throughout history, but it's a specific church at this time that's, um, we'll, we'll see why it's an apostate church. It was a totally lost, false church. No positive word of commendation to this church. And the reason for this dismal state of the church was not immorality but it was their doctrine. It's what they believed. Wow, is doctrine important? Could it do the worst thing possible to any of these churches teaching? Could it do that? Well, what kind of a doctrinal problem could they have that's so bad? It's of epic proportion. The doctrine of Christ was inverted. They believed in Gnosticism. They believed that Jesus was a created being, not God. They believed they had a higher spiritual knowledge above and beyond biblical truth. Notice who writes the letter. Verse 14, the Amen, Jesus. It means what is firm, fixed, unchangeable. He is the Amen. He is the one who confirmed all of God's promises. He's completely trustworthy. He's completely accurate in everything he says. And Jesus Christ himself is the source of creation. He's the origin. He's the power. Through his power, everything was created, John 1.3. This damning heresy about the person of Christ was the reason the Laodicean church was spiritually dead. Their false view of Jesus produced a lost church and that's the hallmark of cults today. You can see that. You look at a cult and you ask them, what do you believe about Jesus Christ? And they will tell you they don't believe he was God. Or if they do believe he is God, he is some form of littler God, not the uh, supreme God. The city was famous for three things. They were a banking mecca. They were a financial force in the world. They had black wool that they made into clothing, number two. And they had a medical school that produced this eye salve that they sent around the world that helped cure eye diseases at the time, which the number one cure or the number one problem with um, blindness at the time was an eye infection. I suspect this addressed that. So all three of these industries are mentioned in the letter. We'll see that later, that God uses those three things to address this church. Something else about Laodicea, the water supply came from miles away from Hierapolis, and the water was transported by these aqueducts, and it took um, a while to get there, so it started as hot water there. There were hot springs, but by the time it reached the city, it's tepid. It's lukewarm. It's foul. They said it was typical that people would vomit when they drank this water. It was so nasty. So the Lord has nothing positive to say about this for this church. In fact, He says it makes Him sick. The Lord says, because you're lukewarm, neither cold or hot, and he'd rather you were one or the other, right? Cold being like against him, a cold heart towards God, or hot, like really on fire for Christ, believing the truth. I want you to be one or the other, not in the middle here. I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. I'm going to vomit you. Revelation 3.16, a, a revolting image of God vomiting them. That gets our attention. I think that's what he's after. It shows us his detestation of apostasy, how important these doctrines are to him. This teaching about his son. It's the only place in the New Testament where the word lukewarm is used. 
The Laodicean lukewarmness was made worse by the fact they were self-deceived. They were totally misled by their pride. They were saying, I'm rich, I have everything I want, and have need of nothing. Look at me. I'm good. And don't you know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked? Completely inaccurate view of themselves. Three features of this city, the wool, the wealth, and this production of ISAB, Jesus offers them these three things. Number one, he offers them spiritual gold. He counsels them to buy gold, verse 18, purified by fire. Peter wrote, a faith more precious, we have a faith that's more precious than gold. A living relationship with God. Two, to, to buy white garments that they might clothe the shame of their nakedness. But they had these black clothes, right? No, in God's sight, spiritually, they're naked. But they're redeemed, and, and white garments are provided for them. The righteousness of Jesus through His sacrifice for them, through His perfect life that's imputed or given to them. Three, He offers them eye salve to anoint their eyes that they might see because they, they prided themselves on their spiritual knowledge, right? They had this great knowledge that's, that uh, gives me insight into everything. It helps me understand. But no, the truth is they were totally spiritually blind. Blindness represents a lack of understanding and knowledge of spiritual truth. The dis Laodiceans desperately needed Christ to open their eyes so that they might turn from darkness to light, that they might receive forgiveness. Verse 19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Is he saying these are just wayward believers here? I don't believe he's saying that. He says, be diligent and turn from your indifference. Get hot. Verse 20, is used in countless tracts <laughs> and messages to say, Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart. And I would suggest to you that's not the context of this passage. What's he knocking on here? It's the door of the Laodicean church. And, and you know what churches are supposed to be, right? Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. In the middle, right? He's like in the middle of the church. But wait a minute, where's Jesus here? He's outside knocking on this church. The things are desperately wrong here. The invitation is first of all, it's personal. The picture, Jesus outside seeking entrance, implies that there were no believers there at all. Jesus offers this though. He says, you know, I want to come and I want to meet with you. I want to dine with you. I want to have supper with you is what the Greek word actually means. The evening meal. To have fellowship and communion and intimacy. I, I would long for that with you. I want that. He urges them to repent and have fellowship with Him before the night of judgment falls. And it's too late. Verse 21 and 22, the magnificent promise to he who overcomes all believers with him, they'll, they'll be on his throne with him. They'll reign with him. And we get to fellowship with Christ. Seven times we've heard these words. Let anyone with ears, they must listen to the Spirit. They must hear what he says and understand what he's saying to the churches. Him who has ears to hear, let him hear. Seven times repeated. So which of these seven churches applies to us? All of them. Yeah. Now it's not that we're in the state that every one of these churches are in. We may be coming to a time when we're going to be like Sardis when we're persecuted. I see a day coming probably in my lifetime as rapidly as things are changing, when this will, when we speak about um, 
homosexuality according to biblical truth and it will be called hate speech. You may be put in jail for that. All these churches apply to us. We need to look at ourselves, honestly. And there's a warning. If we're not where we need to be, we need to come back to Him to repent, to turn, to intimately come to Jesus, to fellowship with Him as we've seen in this last church. And the heresy, if there's any, any error in our teaching, we've got to get it correct. And that's one thing that I have appreciated about this church is, is that we try very hard to stay focused on the gospel. We try very hard when situations come up and church discipline needs to be exercised that we would act on that, that we wouldn't just stand back and do nothing. It's right. So practically, there's many truths taught here. There's a couple more that stick out to me. One is faithfulness. Remaining true to the Word, true to God, no idols, true to our families, and God, no sexual immorality. That's not only in your actions, but in your thoughts. That's harder, isn't it? True to the church, faithful holding to the truth, disciplining as we should, as I said. How can we do these things? How can we do these things? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and only there, right? Only there. Thanks. His strength, the strength that will overcome. He speaks about us in Revelation as overcomers. Let's pray. Thank you for your grace and mercy and truth and these six churches that teach us we pray that we would have ears to hear, eyes to see, that we would have boldness to act as we should. Help us to be convicted in our hearts and need to change and come back to you. And we thank you for your grace and mercy that you are so patient, that you are loving, and that you call men to repentance even in the darkest places. And you provide strength to do that. Through your Son, through His grace, we thank you for your grace which makes it all possible because we can't do it on our own. In Jesus' name, amen.